Hello, this is Dr. Gerald Dirks, formerly the Reverend Gerald Dirks, ordained deacon in the United Methodist Church from Harvard Divinity School, correct? Actually, there's probably four parts to the story. Yes. And the first part would be sort of my journey into the Christian ministry. Yeah. The second part would be my leaving the ministry. Mm -hmm. Third part would be my years as what I called an atypical Christian. Yeah. And then finally, the fourth part, my journey into Islam. Mm -hmm. But you ask about the first part, which is my sort of journey into the Christian ministry. Yeah. I grew up in a small rural community in Kansas where the church was the center of community life. Uh, it was a small town of about 500 people. We had three churches. Uh, every summer there were uh, ice cream socials at the churches, chicken pot pie dinners, mm -hmm. corn roasts, etc. Mm -hmm. And the churches really were the center of community life. And that was true for my family as well. Mm -hmm. We attended the local Methodist church. And uh, throughout my childhood, uh, I was very actively involved in collecting my perfect attendance pens from Sunday school, mm -hmm. my awards for memorizing biblical verses, etc. And so by the time I reached junior high school, uh, I was already considering the ministry as a personal calling. And about that time, uh, during the annual Youth Sunday, uh, I was always selected to deliver the sermon. And word of that got around, and before long I was preaching at various other local churches upon occasion, at nursing homes, at various church-affiliated organizations, etc. How old was this at? Uh, I was probably uh, about uh, 14 wow, when this started. Very, very young age. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I continued in that direction. And at age 17, I entered Harvard College as an undergraduate uh, with a philosophy uh, major which was gearing towards seminary, mm -hmm. and uh, continued on in that direction. In 1970, uh, actually 1969, I received my license to preach mm -hmm. from the United Methodist Church. In 1971, graduated uh, as an undergraduate and entered uh, Harvard Divinity School, which is a three-year program leading to a degree in uh, Master of Divinity. In 1972, I was ordained a deacon in the United Methodist Church. And in 1974, uh, I graduated with a Master of Divinity from uh, uh, Harvard Divinity mm -hmm. School. Spent that summer as an interim minister in two rural parishes in Kansas. But in the fall of 1974, I left the ministry, mm -hmm. or at least left the parish ministry. I was still an ordained minister, but... Uh, Never again would I uh, fill a pulpit after the fall of 1974. Uh, well, at, at the risk of sounding immodest, yeah. uh, typically everywhere I, I preached, we set attendance records. You were like a Jimmy Swaggart at the time? Oh, of your, no, of, no, of no, your, no. I mean, Please don't do that. <laughs> of, of your community, maybe a Joe Olstein of, of the, the small little town? Or well, I, I, I don't want to <laughs> do, do comparisons, but yeah. uh, suffice it to say, uh, attendance typically skyrocketed. Oh, nice. Uh, when when uh, I was behind the pulpit. So well, when people ask me, mm -hmm. I, I usually say there's a long story and a short story. Yes. The short story is a good seminary education. The long story takes a little longer. Mm -hmm. But basically, it, it's one of the ironies of life that the churches often take the uh, most promising of their young ministers and they send them to really good seminaries. And in those really good seminaries, such as the one I was fortunate enough to attend, you are systematically exposed to the oldest existing texts of how the Bible actually once read. You're exposed to the changes that were made in those texts, when those changes took place, why those changes took place, where mm -hmm. those changes took place. Um, so once you receive that knowledge, and those changes, by the way, raise serious, serious questions mm -hmm. about such fundamental Christian doctrines as the Trinity, the Sonship of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, uh, the crucifixion event, and uh, the doctrine of atonement in the blood. All of these come into serious question when you look at the oldest manuscripts that we have 
of what the Bible once said. So that was one consideration. The other consideration is that you are also given a very good grounding in the history of the early church. Now this is seminary school. Yes. Is this at, when, it, when, when does now seminary school come? Is that that's after Harvard now? Well, first you do the undergraduate. I did okay. four years undergraduate at Harvard, okay. received my BA, yes. and then entered Harvard Divinity School, which is a seminary. Yes. And that's a three-year course of studies leading to a Master of Divinity. Okay, gotcha. So the, the second thing you're exposed to is the actual history of the early Christian church. And in terms of that, you're, you're exposed to the decidedly geopolitical machinations that really went into defining some of the fundamental doctrines and dogmas of Christianity. And, and notice I said geopolitical machinations, not theological considerations, mm -hmm. not religious considerations, but political considerations that went in. You're also exposed to the tremendous breadth of knowledge, the tremendous breadth of opinion that existed within early Christianity. You know, it was not monolithic. This is, is this like, kind of like the Christian fic? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> suffice it to say there were many different branches yeah. to early Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, the branch that survived basically into modern times was Pauline Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the Christianity that developed out of the teachings of Paul or, or Saul of Tarsus. This is what's mainstream today? Yes, basically. Okay. Yeah. But there were many other branches to early Christianity, mm -hmm. some of which survived for centuries mm -hmm. before they eventually died out. And one of the fundamental distinctions that uh, we can make is between Pauline Christianity, which was the Christianity that Paul took to the Gentiles and the non-Jews, principally in Europe, but also to a certain extent in Asia Minor. And we can contrast that with what's called the Jerusalem Church. Now, this was the actual disciples of Jesus. Yes. And how they practiced and what they believed. And there were decided differences between these two groups. But over time, because of geopolitical considerations, the different branches of Christianity were sort of systematically eliminated one by one. And when that was done, uh, unfortunately, that was done often at the expense of destroying uh, books that were once considered scripture by some of these branches of Christianity. So a lot of knowledge was lost in the destruction of these books. But these are the, the two fundamental reasons uh, why I left the Christian ministry. It really boiled down to an issue of personal integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, how could I stand behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preach a sermon that I knew was at variance with the actual taproot of Christianity? Of course, if I stood behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and preached what I had been taught in seminary, I'd be looking for a new job within a week. Yeah. So this conflict existed. And as a result, uh, to preserve my personal uh, integrity, I left the active ministry and, and pursued graduate school in clinical psychology. And by the way, approximately half of my graduating class from Harvard Divinity School walked away from the parish ministry upon graduation. So I wasn't the only one. Yes, yes. Of kind course. of people also who have gotten engrossed and really started to go deeper into studying the original text, and many of them, they come to the conclusion that you have that, you know, a lot of this uh, is not making sense. It doesn't fit. Sure, sure. And, and uh, you know, the uh, biblical scholar you mentioned is, is a good example of that, but there are many others as well. Um, can, you, can you name a few that pe some people who are out there, the academics, who they recognize these people, these names? Uh, well, Bart Ehrman is, is certainly one. Uh, but it's really almost any good mm -hmm. biblical scholar yeah. knows. I mean, all you have to do is pick up a good Bible commentary, yeah. such as the Interpreter's Bible Commentary, and begin reading it. Yeah. And you'll be exposed in the process to, wait a minute, this text originally read this way, and this was inserted into the text around the year 380 in Spain. This sort of information's there. It's available to the public, but they have to really go out and study in order to find